So we are uh, in a series of conversations around practicing the presence of people. Uh, God is actually inviting you to uh, be in relationship with people, which is pretty amazing. Uh, you, you cannot be as introverted as you want to be, okay? And after COVID, I've become kind of like a closet introvert myself, to be honest with you. I don't like to promote it, but there's just something about being home and not going out. It's amazing. Maybe it was like when I hit like 33, I was like, you actually can just stay home. It's like amazing. Like you don't have to go out. Like you don't have to do this to yourself. You don't have to like be out and talking to everybody that you see. You can just stay home. It's amazing, really. It's life-giving. So if you're an extrovert, just try it. Like take a week and be like, I'm just going to do it this week. I'm just going to like stay home and not do anything. It is. It'll radically transform your life. You can tell people, no, it's amazing. Anyway, um, you can't do it forever, though. So if you stay home all the time and you're just like, I'm just going to read books until I die, like, don't do that. It's not healthy. You need to be in a relationship with people. Uh, so today we're going to talk about a few things um, that are going to challenge you. Because, like, here's the deal. Everywhere that you go when you're with people, when you leave, you're leaving something behind. Like every, every conversation you have, every environment you walk into, you are actually leaving an impression on people everywhere you go. This isn't like hard. This is normal life. You understand this. Like there's, there's like basically there's, there's fruit that you're leaving behind everywhere you go. And like you can smell it. You know what I mean? Like everybody's got a scent, like sometimes real. And if you are that person, you need someone to tell you that it's okay. We're going to get through it together, but um, no, but like even like philosophically. So I remember when I was a senior in high school, my goal, because um, my brother was the type of person, like he's a lawyer, he's like, he, he just loved his school. There's something about it. He'd come home in like ninth grade doing like four hours of homework, and I just didn't have time for that because I was, I wanted to be out with people. I was like, my parents would be like, why aren't you studying? Because like, I got friends, like so I'm out. What are you talking about? Like, people want to see me. So I would do, like, 20 minutes of homework, maybe. It was, just, it was the struggle was real. My parents didn't know what to do with me. Um, but I did great. So my senior year, I was like, I'm going to get a National Honor Society. That's going to be my goal. I'm going to take a few study halls, a couple easy classes, and they're going to give me those, those stupid tassels. Because they don't, like, they don't mark the tassels like you got them on the last day. Literally, my graduation day, they, like, gave me the tassels. It was, ama it was amazing. Because you look like you've been on it since ninth grade. It's perfect. Um, but the one class that I did take that was a challenge was physics. I don't like math. I don't like calculus. It's just a thing. Um, also found out the teacher and I hated each other. I, it was like, I, it was bad. And like, I, at this point, I'm like 18, okay? I was like, I knew I was going to go to Bible school, right? So like, I'm a Jesus follower. My friends made fun of me because I went to church. You know, I didn't sleep with my girlfriends. Like, oh, look, girlfriends, what are you talking about? I had like one... <laughs> Nuts. I was a church kid. All my girlfriends. It's crazy. Um, it's, not, it's crazy. Uh, anyway, we just couldn't. They all knew, but man, this teacher and I, it was, I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was about this guy, but we just, it was just a thing. So I was terrible to him. I was like so disrespectful, and I'm not proud of it, but I was. And I, I've never apologized. I probably should. After this, you can be like, you definitely should. But um, we would like give us, we're seniors in high school. He's giving us a break halfway through class. He's like, you guys need some water? It's like, yeah, man. So we'd go, we wouldn't come back. It's just like, <laughs> like, why would you do this? Like, oh man, he'd have you check your neighbor's work, you know, and that's how you would get some grades. So obviously everybody's getting an A, this is dumb. Um, he put like a dartboard because it's physics. So like flight trajectories, he put a dartboard in the room and then he puts a line we have to shoot from. It's like, and we're, I'm literally, I'm basically an adult. We're standing on the other side of the classroom with real darts and just whipping darts across the room. And he's just like beside himself with annoyance. Like I would openly, I didn't tell this to last service because I don't want you guys to like think I'm a respectable person. I would, we would like openly like make fun of him. It was terrible. Like it was bad. Okay. It was bad. And I'm admitting it. Okay. I had a problem. My sister's a few years younger than me. She gets to her senior year. Okay. She's a couple years younger. She gets, she takes physics too. And so he's like, Janelle Jansen? She's like, yeah. She's like, is Josh your brother? She's like, yeah. She's, he's like, oh, wow. And she's like, he's in Bible school. Like, he's going to be a pastor. And I kid you not, he didn't, like, he didn't believe her. Like, he didn't believe her. He's like, Josh Jansen? Like, it was, it was, not, it was not okay. Um, it wasn't good. So anyway, all that to tell you that I'm working through some stuff. But, um, but everybody that you come in contact with is going to experience you for who you are. And when you leave, there is a scent. 
and you know, you like, you get it. When you're around someone who's just like incredibly kind and they're like with you and you can just tell, like when they're talking to you, they're like, they're looking in your eyes. They're not like frantically and like pedantically trying to figure out something else to do, but they're like giving you their time. If you go to their house, they, they've, they've maybe set it up in a way where you're like, man, this is like an incredible, I could just be here all day. And when you leave or when they leave your home, you like say to your wife or your friends, like, man, we got to have that. We got to have them back. Like that was like a lot of fun. There's like no, there's no, there's no vibe, you know? And then you know the opposite. When you invite someone over and it's like, we have to end this as quickly as humanly possible. Like, I don't know what we can do to get them out. Do we like start a fire? Like, what do we do to like make this end? And then they leave and you know, it's like, there's just like this like funk. You're like, what is this? You don't know if you should walk around the house with like sage burning or like if you like need to like pray and do prayer walks around the house. You're just trying to figure out like how there's a funk. And like you need to understand is like everyone has some sort of smell that they're leaving behind. You just have to ask yourself the question like what smell are people smelling when they experience me? Like when people think about you, what do they think about? Like have you ever like taken stock like Let's just say if we could be morbid for a second that today was our very last day. Let's say tomorrow, all people will have of us is like the memory of who we were. Like what would their memories be about how you made them feel? And then if you want to get crazy, let's add faith into the mix. Let's say we call ourselves followers of Jesus and people are experiencing us in our everyday lives. What about Jesus are they experiencing when they experience me? Has the way I carried myself, the way I lived my life, has it positively or negatively affected the message of Jesus to the people who are experiencing me? Now, what I'm about to say, I'm going to say a word that is going to like maybe jar the room a little bit, but you just got to give me some grace to be able to explain what I'm about to say. Okay, because here's the reality. The, the fruit of your life, it has a scent. And if you want the fruit of your life to smell good, you need to experience death. Now, the way the English language works, we have one word to describe everything that other languages have a multiplicity of words to explain. So the reality is you and I right now, we have a way to posture our desires we have our default reflexes. We have our creature comforts. We have life set up in a way just how we want. You've got this thing here. You've got the way your family set up there. You've got your work structure set up. You are, we have made it extremely comfortable. We make sure we check things like our cell phone time to make sure that we're like on it a lot. We don't want to be weird, but we're not on it too much, you know, where it's alarming. But like we, you've got your comforts and we we'll sleep till whenever we want. You've got it. Now, when scripture talks about like you need to die to yourself daily, what, it's, what we're saying is you need to experience a change of your default reflexes, your default posture. It is a death to myself. If you want your fruit to smell good, you need to be willing to experience death. Now, this death is incredibly costly. Because again, we've got it set up perfectly. I know exactly how I want this life to work out. To change it, it's costly. To change the way people view me, to change the way people take me in, to change the way people experience my like spunky personality, it is costly. The death that we are going to talk about. But I'm going to take you to a passage of scripture. Now last week, Pierre talked about Lazarus. Lazarus was a man, he was one of Jesus' closest friends. They don't consider him one of the disciples, but he was like a best friend. In some ways, it's probably almost better. He doesn't get like, Jesus doesn't yell at him all the time. It's like none of that stuff. It's just like, we're just, we're just buddies, you know? Lazarus gets super sick. He's got two sisters, Mary and Martha. Now, this is so crazy. If you read the story, Jesus, like, he could have gone and like prayed for Lazarus, heals him, but Jesus, like, it's, it's for your good that this happened. It's like, what? He shows up four days late. Lazarus has been dead. 
And it's like, it's, it's a terrible story. And like Jesus sees the humanity of people, like Martha, she gets there first. If you know anything about Mary and Martha, Martha's so on top of everything. Her calendar's perfectly organized, it's like structured. She does like all the timekeeping methods that you'd wanna do, like Pomodoro method, she's on it. Like she's crushing it, okay? It's like, anyway, she shows up for, if you don't know what Pomodoro method is, someone in here does, and I just really bless them, okay? Anyway, um, <laughs> like, man, uh, she shows up first. She's like, she's like Lord, if you would've just been here on time, like, you would, have, you would have done it. And then Mary, Mary is just decently flighty. She's a feeler. She's a deep person. Always just wants to sit at the feet of Jesus. She shows up late because she's crying at the house with everybody. She's just all up in her feels. She shows up. Mary, Martha has to come back and be like, hey, Mary, Jesus is there. Mary goes. She's like, Lord, if you would have just been here, my brother would have been like, you would have healed him. So Jesus feels all the pain that's happening. And the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. He yells out to the tomb, Lazarus, come out. Would have been wild. If you were there, you would have been like, oh my gosh, what is happening? He shuffles out in his grave clothes. And what Pierre talked about last week, Lazarus, and he told him, take the grave clothes off. You can't walk around with grave clothes on. It's weird. Once Jesus impacts you, like the whole thing. Listen to last week's, subscribe to the YouTube channel. It'll help you. Anyway, a couple days later, they're going to go celebrate this happening with a nice dinner. Okay, in between... The Pharisees are like, we need to kill Jesus and we need to kill Lazarus. We can't have all these people following this guy. It's a very dangerous setup that's happening right now. Nobody's safe. What is happening is outrageously alarming. Okay, so you'd think Lazarus is better. He's very safe now. No, no. Lazarus was an innocent bystander to Jesus doing something great for him. And now they want Lazarus dead. So anyway, here's where we go. We pick it up in John chapter 12, verse 1. It says, six days before the Passover... Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, obviously, is what happens. Now, here's the deal. Martha always gets a bad rap because Martha's always serving and Mary's always at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said the line, like, Mary's chose the better thing. Okay, first of all, it's easy to be Mary when you're not Martha, okay? If you are a Martha in the room, I just want you to know that she didn't change what she was doing after Jesus said, like, Mary's the, pick the better thing. Someone has to put the food out. If everybody's Mary, nobody's going to eat, okay? So anyway, if you are a Martha, pause once in a while, take a deep breath, and realize that Jesus is in the room. Like, stop and be like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And then you can continue. But anyway, Mary served. That was for free. Martha served <laughs> while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took, this is crazy, then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray, Je to betray Jesus, he objected. He says, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And John writes, he continues, he says, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to put what he, uh, to what was put into it. Man, that was, first of all, savage. Nobody asked for that aside. John just put it in there. It's crazy. It's like, <laughs> we didn't ask for it. I just love that it's in there. And Jesus, so leave her alone, like Jesus replies. It was intended that you should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. You will always have the poor among you. You will not always have me. This is, this is wild because here, here's the deal. There was nothing happening at this dinner that called for Mary to get up and do what she did. This would have actually been a really awkward moment. Because notice what she does. It, the scripture says pure nard. It doesn't say like it was like Eve Saint Laurent perfume. Nard sounds ugly, but I'm letting you know that it was like also known as like spike nard. The only place you can get the ingredients was like in the Himalayan mountain range in India, China. This stuff was so expensive. It literally says a year's wages. That's like salary. Imagine saving a year's worth of your salary to purchase a liquid. That is nuts. What it shows you, now Jesus, he said, like, it, it was, she prepared it, she's preparing it for my burial. Mary had no idea when Jesus was going to die. She didn't know at this point. Like, Jesus is always talking, like, future prophetic stuff. Like, Mary, for Mary, this stuff was the utmost expensive thing that she had probably in the house. Take it a step further. 
what was customary at this time, you show up to a house, people don't have cool shoes on, they wore sandals, they didn't have paved roads, okay, their feet were dirty. You'd show up at a house, someone would be at the door, they'd wash your feet with water and a towel. That would be normal. Now, I don't know if there was at this house, if they had someone, but for whatever reason, Mary, she could have used water. It would have been just as awkward if she would have grabbed a towel and some water while they're eating and started washing someone's feet. It would have been just as weird. It probably would have gotten the point across. And then she doesn't use a towel. She uses her own hair. Now, for a Jewish woman in this culture, they would, you would head coverings, it's modesty, it's, de- it's letting everybody know that you're decent and in order. It's letting everybody know you've got a great reputation, you've put yourself together, you're not going to show your hair, it's not considered a holy thing to do. So now she's using a perfume that costs a, a year's wages, and she's exposing the thing that's been covered, her hair, for however long. She, this is an incredibly awkward moment. You see, in some ways you could say, that a week prior to this, Mary experienced the death of her brother. And then she watches this man raise him from the dead. And now in this moment, remember we said that, that the death we're talking about is a change of posture. It's a change of desires. It's, a saying, it's saying like I, I, my, I have an idea of what I want my reputation to be. In this moment, Mary has chosen to die to herself. What she's doing is she's choosing a posture that reflects the very love that Jesus has shown her. What she is doing here is she's taking something that everybody deems extremely valuable and expensive. What this shows is that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus probably come from some money. When people saw them, they probably knew there's wealth, there's status, there's position, there's something about those people. They just have their lives together. She takes this very perfume that she could have saved for whatever reason, maybe Jesus' burial, and she says, no, in this moment, I'm going to pour it on his feet just to show him how much I love him. In her mind, this was her reasonable act of worship. In view of God's mercy, I'm going to give the most expensive thing that I own, and I'm going to hand it to the man who's changed my life. You see, in order, the only way that the story of Jesus becomes real is when you deny yourself and follow him. The only way this becomes real is when you look at God and say, you are the most important thing in my life. I'm not just calling you a teacher. I'm not just calling you a good historical figure, but you are the actual Lord of my life. In response to that, all of my plans, all of my treasures, All of my time, the way I view my family, the way I view my work, everything that I thought was once important to me. What Paul would say is all those things I consider rubbish for the sake of following Jesus. It is costly. I'm not up here today to let you know that, oh, this is the easiest thing you'll ever have to do. It's easy. If you ever come into a body of believers and someone acts like this is like, this is so simple. No, no, no. We have our lives set up a particular way, and we love it to be that way. What God is saying is, are you willing to offer all of it to me? Are you willing? Are you willing to go the costly road of dying and denying yourself? Are you willing to count that cost? This is not a self-serving gospel. Jesus, they tried to trap him once. They said, hey, what's the greatest commandment? talking about the law of Moses. Jesus says, okay, the first one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Essentially, if you can start there, if you can start by all of your affection going towards God, so the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So you, you say you love God, show me by how you love people. This is not self-serving. If at any point you read scripture And you think, man, the goal of this is to find my truth. I'm letting you know you're doing this wrong. If at any moment you think that God is up in heaven kind of scratching his head wondering, what am I going to do? Like you're reading it wrong. The goal has never changed. The goal has always been costly, pure devotion to the one who has given us everything. See, the death that we're talking about is costly. 
The reality is, though, this is not the American dream, but this can be your best life. But it requires you to deny yourself and follow him. The response to the kindness and mercy of God has always, has never been a deep breath of relief. I've made it. It's always been every single day, I'm going to deny myself and follow Jesus. It's expensive, but it sticks with people. And we have to get this before we move on. Because in order to show people the love of Jesus, the way that scripture and we have been talking about for weeks describes, you have to know where to start. We sing about it. We talk about it. It's building your life on the idea that my, I, everything that I have belongs to him. And again, it is a costly decision, but it's a fragrance. Scripture says when she, she pours the, the perfume on his feet, it said that the fragrance filled the house. Now, could you imagine the vibe of the party? Everybody's having a great time. People are pumped. Lazarus is back. It's like, it's unbelievable. They're decently scared, especially the disciples. They know, like, this is probably not going to go well for us. But there's a, there's a vibe at this party. And it's probably bursting at the seams. And then all of a sudden, there's probably people who've forever, they've heard about this, like, nard stuff. They've probably never seen it. They've, they've heard about the, what the smell can do to a room, but they've never smelled it. There's others who've probably smelled it, but only a couple times. Now the whole house is filling with an empty bottle of pure nard that is poured over someone's feet. The entire vibe of the party changes when everybody's smelling this stuff. Now the party's over. It's not really a party anymore. It's like, what in the world is going on? Have you ever smelled something? It's like it could either be so putrid or so good, it just changes the vibe. You know what I mean? Like, I remember, like, I was at the, I went to the Bible school. We didn't do, like, cool pranks. We stole a wedding cake once from the, a reception. That was terrible. That's a dark, that was a dark one. I don't know what happened. Kid comes running back into the dormitory with a cake. I'm like, where'd you get that? He's like, oh, the reception. I think he just took it? He's like, yeah, it was very good, but we shouldn't have done that. It was, Yeah. On this other occasion, someone pranked me. I don't remember what they did, but like, so I bought sardines. I opened the thing of sardines and I like hid it under a chair in their dorm room. And I went to class and then I came back and I, I didn't smell it. I was like, it's not working. And so I went back into the room because I was an RA. So I had a key, which is really good. And I just poured a little bit of the sardine juice on the carpet. Nuts. I went back to class. I come back. You could literally, you get within a hundred yards of the room of the building. And it's just like, it smells. This is what we did. We probably should have done, we probably should have had parties, to be honest with you. This is nuts what we were doing. And so uh, the, the building's empty. Everybody's outside. They're like, I'm like, what's going on? They're like, there's sardine juice all over the carpet. I'm like, oh man, that stinks. Uh, and so, but man, there is something about fragrance. They say that the smell, like smells can like bring back memories. Right? Smell is such a powerful tool. And it happens so fast. Like, you smell things so quick. Faster than most other senses, you're smelling. And, like, the, the, the importance of how things smells is unbelievable. And so at this house, the entire party would have changed because people would have been like, oh, my, there's probably people there. They were like, man, I remember one time, like, my mom, like, sprayed that stuff just a little bit just so we could smell what nard smelled like. Some people would have been like, I've heard of what this is. I've never actually smelled it. I wonder what they're doing down there. Who just sprayed that? And then the, the gathering place would have come to this room where they probably thought someone was just testing out nard. Like Mary brought it out and was like, hey, you, you want to smell a little bit? And she's like dolloping it on people's wrists. And then to look and see this woman on her hands and knees wiping feet with the most costly perfume in the culture changes the whole vibe of the party. This is no longer business as usual. But when your first love is Jesus, the response will always be an expensive love towards people. It's expensive, but the fragrance will always be great. You have to ask yourself, what is your smell? You see, because here's what's crazy, is that I actually think that Judas was onto something. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We could have paid for so many things for poor people. Imagine what we could have done for the poor. Now, John, 
John throws so much shade. He's like, you don't care about poor people. He's robbing us anyway. What's crazy to me is Jesus doesn't say, John, you don't care about poor people. Or Judas, you don't care about poor people. You're robbing us anyway. He's like, whoa, leave her alone. He's like, the poor you're always going to have with you. But I won't always be here. Do you realize that right now, you and I are living in the I won't always be here time period? Like, if Jesus was sitting physically in this room, this would be a different conversation. It'd be very normal for us to go up and, and to his physical person, be like, okay, the poor we're always going to have with us. But right now, the God-man is here. See, I think Judas actually understood something. He was doing it in all the wrong ways. Of course he was going to rob them. But he understood there's something about being a follower of Jesus that has to show kindness to disenfranchised people. There's something about this Christian thing that must show love to people. And so Jesus, what's so wild to me is that what Jesus does is a few days later, there's another dinner. We've called it the Last Supper forever. There's paintings about it. It says that when, they, when the disciples, they sat down for their evening meal. I love how scripture doesn't tell you where they got the meal from. Have you ever thought about this? It's not like Peter's in there cooking. No, I, I have to think that because the, like, Lazarus had a price on his head, they were trying to kill him. I think from the moment that Lazarus was raised from the dead, Martha, Mary, Lazarus, at least those three, they just stayed with him through the end. The only person who always showed up, who had a tendency to always be there, Mary was always there. Mary's at the tomb. Mary's at the dinner with Lazarus. Mary's is, Mary, I guarantee you, Mary must have been at least in the background. Now, it's not in scripture, so if that offends you, I'm sorry. I just like to think that Mary and Martha and Lazarus prepared this meal. And there's nothing about the meal when you read about John, in John chapter 13. Nothing about this meal screamed, hey, someone should get up and start washing our feet now. Nothing did. But Jesus gets up in this moment, he ties a towel around his waist, and he starts washing the disciples' feet. And I think everybody in the room remembers Judas saying, hey, like, we could have done so much for the poor. And I think Jesus maybe like winked at him before he's like, hey, just so you know, you've called me master and teacher, that's what I am. But now you can call me Lord. And I've given you an example, and now you should go and do likewise to other people. And I think he winks at Judas like, see, the poor people matter. The people who are far from God, they actually matter. How you carry yourself from this moment forward. He actually says at one point, it's better that I leave so that the Holy Spirit can come. It's better that I leave so that you can actually be the hands and feet and give the message of hope, love, peace, and joy to the people that you're going to meet in your culture. You see, there is something about viewing God's mercy and the response of showing love and kindness to the people around us that it produces a fruit that lasts. You see, you need to understand that this is a moment where Jesus is basically looking at, if I were to do this, so if we can just be honest with each other for a moment. Now, here's the deal. When, if, if I talk about things like, if I say like the church, okay, I mean the movement of believers, the body of like believers around the globe, not necessarily a building with four walls. And it's like, I'm not bashing that. I'm not even bashing the church, really. I love the church. I've given everything to building the kingdom of God. But if we can just be honest for a moment and just think about how we've designed following Jesus. If we're not careful, we live in a world where you can actually be an, be an American before you're a follower of Jesus. We live in a culture where uh, you can decide that how we operate in this culture as an American is more important than being a follower of Jesus. You see, if we're not careful, and I think politics are some of the most, it's, it's so important because like we actually get to decide things. It's absolutely it's a brilliant system. But if we're not careful, I think we think that God's up there stressed out about what's going to happen this year in the election. I don't think it's the point. I don't think, I don't think, I, I mean, maybe he cares on some level. We should care on some level because we get to decide things. It's pretty cool. I don't think it makes God nervous. But if we're not careful, we'll change what the fruit of the Spirit is supposed to be. Like, think about it. Maybe you find yourself today and you're a decently selfish person. And you've convinced yourself that, like, 
I'm just selfish. It's just how I am. It's like this wouldn't be comfortable. I got a cut glove on, which are pretty cool. It doesn't hurt at all, guys. So if you cut yourself while you're cooking, buy a cut glove. Um, anyway, uh, maybe you, you, you view yourself and you just, it just becomes a part of who you are. I'm, I'm selfish. Something I'm working through, like I'm, I'm just selfish. I think about myself all the time. Maybe you're decently skeptical about everything. You're skeptical about people, skepticism. Your friends even know it. You're a skeptic. You're overly critical. You constantly make decisions based on safety and comfort. Maybe when you look at culture, you're decently suspicious about people. Maybe you view yourself as someone who's just got it all together. Man, when I think about holiness, I've got it down. Don't come at me with like the secular stuff. Maybe you've marked down the last time you've actually listened to it like a secular song on the radio, and you're not, in, which is fine, but you're wearing it as like a badge of honor that you're better. You see, what the issue is, is if we walk around with the mentality that like I'm angry and it's just kind of how I'm wired, the destruction we're doing to the church at large. In some ways, you could say that the lingering stench of this is killing the church at large. Like, think about it. If we've gotten our posture so and our desire so jacked up that we think that our personality trumps the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're killing the church. If we think that I'm just wired as a selfish person, I have a tendency to overdrink. It's just I'm Irish. It's just how I am. No, no, no. You're destroying people's view of God. Like, oh, I listen. I like my life is set up. Like, I'm only I only ever grew up with white people. I only ever see white people. So like, I just don't get other cultures. No, no, no. Like, God is actually a diverse God. He's actually called us to build bridges. Like you cannot, people will say like, I just got to, like I'm going to wait. They've been, people have been saying, the church has been saying we should wait since at least the civil rights movement. You can't wait. There's no time. Learn to make friends. Anything less is a destruction of what the church is supposed to be. No one has ever found comfort in this. All this does is cuts people. That's all it does. So you may be walking around trying to build church holding a bunch of knives, ready to poke at the next person that pushes you the wrong way, ready to stick the next person that cuts you off in, a, in your car, ready to do anything other than show what the fruit of the Spirit is supposed to be. People, could you imagine the lingering smell of someone who understands love, think about it. Like the fruit of the Spirit is love, like unconditional love. Joy, I mean, it's not talking about happiness, although it is nice to be happy, but like joy in the face of like things not going well, still being a stand up on your own feet and be like, we're gonna get through this. A perseverance and determination in the face of hardship, like joy, peace. Scripture actually says we're supposed to be peacemakers. Like, think about what a peacemaker does. The things a peacemaker chooses not to say when the door is open for them to just destroy someone with a really good comment on Facebook. Like, imagine, imagine what a peacemaker does. Patience. Imagine. I'm just not a patient person. It's like, no, you're wrong, though. So, like, I mean, like, patience. How do people experience your patience? Kindness. I love that kindness is in there. Because these other ones, like, and the, he ends with self-control, which to me just takes the cake. It's like all these other things, love is just like in the air. Love is just like out there. It's like, oh yeah, I love people. Of course I love people. Self-control? That's way too practical. <laughs> like that, now you're making me actually make it like self-control. He talks about kindness. Like, are you nice to people? This isn't, this isn't hard to understand. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. This isn't like an achievement list. It's just like, hey, do you have the Holy Spirit with you? You'll be kind. So how kind are you towards people? 
This isn't hard. Goodness, gentleness. I love, I'm just a rough person. No. The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Self-control. Like Jesus take the wheel is not a fruit of the Spirit, just so you know. Like self-control will go a long way. And here's the reality, is that we'll look at our knives. We'll look at those things that make us sharp, that make us, and if we are not careful, you'll meet Jesus, and then all of a sudden you'll be like, you'll, you'll hide these things and be like, I never want to speak of that again. The shame associated with knives in our lives can be destructive to you. But what is crazy is I think that the, the goodness of the fruit of the Spirit only becomes real when you allow God to use the things that were once problems for you as tools to actually expose the goodness of God. Because at this point, all this is is covered fruit. If you bit into this, it's bitter, it's disgusting, no one wants any part of it. Yeah, on the shell you say you're a grapefruit, but when I bite into you, I just want to vomit. Like, no one wants this. No one wants to eat the rind of a lime. But when you allow the Holy Spirit to use those things that used to hold you back, those things that used to make you the person that you once were, and allow it to become the story of the goodness and faithfulness of God. Now, people, this is fruit that actually lasts. This is the stuff that will actually linger in a culture that is desperate for hope. This is the stuff. This is the juice that oozes eternity in the hearts and minds of people. This is the attractiveness that the world actually needs. What's so wild is we live in a culture that's so obsessed with this, they don't even know what they're like. I just got to find my truth. It's like, no, no, no. Just experience for a moment the goodness of God. Just experience with me for a moment how good it smells to be around love, joy, peace, patience, kind. Who doesn't want that? How many people are sitting up tonight anxious about Monday? How am I going to get through another week of this? They're not paying me enough. They're not doing enough for me. I'm not getting enough for my family. If I could just, what am I going to do? And you're white knuckling your way through your week. What would happen if you experienced love, joy, peace, patience, kindness? You see, this doesn't take long to linger. If I cut a few more of these, the smell would truly fill the room. If we caught a little more of this, the smell would intoxicate you. Like if you just sat here and cut grapefruit after grapefruit, all you would smell for days is grapefruit. If I don't wash my hands for days, I'm going to have the stench of citrusy grapefruit. This is what makes the gathering of believers so important. What makes the gathering of believers isn't just a thing. This is just a program. This isn't just an event. What's supposed to happen is that the fruit of the Spirit is so intoxicating in this place. For some, it's a reminder that you can keep going. For some, the intoxicating stench of the fruit of the Spirit is so real that you just need a little encouragement to keep going one more day. It's in the gathering of believers that that happens. What is so destructive is when people who are far from God and are holding a bunch of knives because they've tried everything that culture can give them, for that, it's not working. The worst thing that happens is they come into a group of people that are just holding more knives. Be like, oh, you want to come in here? Okay, let's get a few things straight. Nothing will last with that mentality. But people who are willing to hold the fruit of the Spirit in their hands and invite people from all corners of the culture in and be like, I know that you think your personal identity is the most important thing about you, but let me show you a better way. I know you think that anger has marked you forever, but let me show you a different way. I know you think that you'll never beat your addiction, but let me show you a different way. I know that you think 
that you're going to go to sleep anxious every night from here to eternity. Let me give you some therapy and show you a different way. Like maybe things, I think that what ends up happening is that the revival that so many Pentecostals have prayed for for years actually happens when people decide to cut through the bitter rind of perceived holiness and say, I am just going to allow the ooze of my destructive past and the mercy of God in the midst of it be a testimony to what God can do for you. So today, I'm not sure where you are at with the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure where you are at with your walk with God. But I want you to know that there is a living, active Holy Spirit who wants to give you love. He wants to give you joy. He wants to give you peace. He wants patience. He wants gentleness, goodness, self-control. Could you imagine if just for a week we focused on one of them when we were around people? If we just said, for this week, I'm going to use self-control in my dealings with people, we would truly change the world. But the Bible doesn't say these are the fruit of the Spirit. It says this is the fruit of the Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, you have all of them, all at once, all together. All of this can follow you all the days of your life. The question is, have you denied yourself today? So I don't know where you're at today. But I know that the Holy Spirit wants to remind you to deny yourself. Follow after him and experience the fruit of the Spirit when you're interacting with people. Church, can we pray together? God, we thank you that you are good. God, we thank you that when we aren't faithful, you are continually faithful. God, in this room, we thank you for every story, every past, every decision, every knife that has been a part of our story. God, we thank you that you have been faithful in the midst of it. God, we pray against shame that can so easily cloud our stories. But God, you help us to use our stories to cut through the rind of perceived holiness. God, we pray for a culture that so desperately needs you. God, we pray that in this moment you give us a vulnerability to be real with humans. God, help us to be a place that oozes with the fragrance of heaven. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.